Uh, why don't you sit here? Go sit here. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, before we get started, I, I think, uh, you know, there were some pioneers. Of course, uh, we have the pioneers uh, here on stage, but there were some other really important pioneers in the video we just saw, and a couple of them are here in the audience. So, uh, Mitch Kapor, who is a regular at D, could you just stand up and wherever you are, there he is. And, and Fred Gibbons, who has not come to D before, but is here tonight. Fred. There's Fred. Right there. And I don't know if he's in the room, but I do want to recognize uh, our, our fellow journalist, Brent Schlender from Fortune, who did the last, to my knowledge, the last joint interview these guys did. It was not on a stage, but it was a Fortune magazine interview. Brent, I, I don't know if you're in the room, if you are. Can you stand? Maybe he's... Oh, maybe right back there. Way over there. So, um, so let's get started. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, there's been a lot of like mano a mano catfight kind of thing in a lot of the blogs and the press and stuff like that. And we wanted to, the first question I kind of was interested in asking is what you think each has contributed to the computer and technology industry, starting with you, Steve, for Bill. and vice versa? Um, well, you know, Bill built the first software company in the industry. And uh, I think he built the first software company before anybody really in our industry knew what a software company was, except for these guys. And that was huge. That was really huge. And the business model that they ended up pursuing turned out to be the one that worked really well, you know, for the industry. Mm -hmm. So... I think, but the, the, the biggest thing was Bill was really focused on software before almost anybody else had a clue that, that it was really the software. It was that's, that's what I see. I mean, I, a lot of other things you could say, but that's the high order bit. And I think building a company is really hard. And, and it, requires, it requires your greatest persuasive abilities to hire the best people you can and keep them, keep them, keep them at your company and keep them working, you know, doing the best work of their lives, hopefully. And uh, Bill's been able to stay with it for all these years. So, Bill, how about the contribution of Steve and Apple? Well, first I want to clarify, I'm not fake Steve Jobs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what Steve's done is quite phenomenal. You know, if you look back to 1977, that Apple II computer, the idea that it would be a mass market machine. Uh, you know, the bet that was made there by Apple uniquely, there were other people with products, but the idea that this could be an incredible empowering phenomena, Apple pursued that dream. Uh, you know, then uh, one of the most fun things we did together was the Macintosh, and that was so risky. You know, people may not remember that Apple really bet the company. Lisa hadn't done that well, and uh, you know, some people were saying, okay, that general approach wasn't good. But the team that Steve built, even within the company, to pursue that, uh, even some days it felt a little ahead of its time. Uh, I don't remember that Twiggy disk drive. And, 128K. Yeah. Uh, and... Ah, uh, the Twiggy disk drive, <laughs> yes. Steve gave a speech once, which is one of my favorites, where he talked about, in, in a certain sense, we build the products that we want to use ourselves. Uh, and, you know, so he's really pursued that with incredible taste and elegance that has had a, a huge impact on the industry. Uh, and his ability to always come around and figure out where that next bet should be uh, has been phenomenal. You know, Apple literally was failing when Steve went back and... Uh, reinfused the uh, innovation and risk taking that have uh, been phenomenal. So the industry's benefited immensely uh, from his his work. We've both been lucky to be part of it, but uh, you know I'd say he's contributed as much as anyone. Um, well, we've also we've yeah, also ahead. both been incredibly lucky to have had great partners that we started the companies with, and we've attracted great people. I mean, so. Uh, Everything that's been done at Microsoft and at Apple has been done by just remarkable people. 
uh, none of which are sitting up here, you know, today. Well, not us. Well, you're sort of the... Not, <laughs> not, not, not us. <laughs> and you're sort of... You're, so, you're, in a way, you're the stand-ins for all those, all yeah, those other people. in a way we are. Um, in a very tangible way. So, Bill mentioned the Apple II in, in 1977 and <clears throat> 30 years ago, and there were a couple of other computers with... Uh, which were uh, aimed at the idea that average people might be able to use them. And looking back on it, and a really average, average person might not have been able to use them uh, by today's standards, but it certainly broadened the base of who could use computers. I actually looked at, a, uh, at an Apple ad from 1978. It was a print ad that shows you how ancient it was. And, uh, and it said, thousands of people have discovered the Apple computer. Thousands of people. <laughs> Uh, and it also said, you don't want to buy one of these computers where you put a cartridge in. I think that was a, a reference to one of the Atari or something. Oh, no. You want a computer you can write your own programs on. And so the world, and obviously people we had some, still We do, had some but, very strange ads back then. We had one where it was in a kitchen, and there was a, a, a woman that looked like the wife, and she was typing in recipes on the computer with the husband looking on approvingly in the back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah, how did that work for you? <laughs> I, I don't think well. <laughs> so, um, but, but just think back to, I, I know that you started Microsoft prior to 1977. You, I think Apple started the year before in 76. 76. Microsoft in 74, was 74 when we started 75. Right the and then, but, yeah, then we did the ba ship the basic in 75. Okay. Um, most people, uh, I, some people here, but I don't think most people know that there was actually a, a, some Microsoft software in that Apple II computer. Do you want to talk about what happened there, or how that how that occurred? Yeah, the, uh, the there had been the Altair and a few other companies, actually about 24, that had done various machines. But the 77 group included the PET, uh, TRS-80, Com Commodore. and the Com yeah, yeah. Commodore PET. Uh, TRS-80, and the Apple II. The original Apple II basic, the integer basic, uh, we had nothing to do with. But then there was a floating point one uh, where, uh, and I mostly worked with Waz on that. Uh, I made it. Well, let me tell this story. <laughs> so Waz, <laughs> Waz, my partner, we started out with this guy named Steve Wozniak, brilliant, brilliant guy. He writes this basic that is like the best basic on the planet. It does stuff that no other basic's ever done. You don't have to run it to find your error messages. It finds them when you type it in and stuff. It's perfect in every way, except for one thing, which is it's, it's just fixed point, right? It's not, it's not floating point. And so we're getting a lot of input that people want this basic to be floating point. And like we're begging Waz, please, please make this floating point. Who's we? How many people are in Apple? Well, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're begging Waz to make this floating point. And he, he just never does it, you know, and he wrote it by hand on paper. I mean, you know, he didn't, we, he didn't have an assembler or anything to write it with. It was all just written on paper, and he'd type it in. He just never got around to making a Why? floating point. Why? Well, this is one of the mysteries of life. I don't know. <laughs> but he never did. And so, you know, Microsoft had this very popular, really good floating point basic that we ended up going to them and saying, help. And, and, and how much was the, I think you were telling us earlier? That was $31,000. That Apple uh, paid you for For that. the floating point basic. And I flew out to Apple. I spent two days there getting the cassette. The cassette tapes were the main ways that people stored things at the time. <laughs> right. Uh, and, you know, that was fun. I think the most fun uh, is, is later uh, when we worked together. Well, what was the most fun? Tell, tell the story about the most fun that was later. And maybe later, not the most fun. <laughs> Let him, let him talk. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Well, you know, Steve can probably uh, start it better. The, the team that was assembled there to do the Macintosh was a very committed team. And there was an equivalent team on our side that just got totally focused on this activity. Jeff Harbors, a lot of uh, incredible people. And we really had bet our future um, because we, on the Macintosh being successful, and then hopefully graphics interface in general being successful. But first and foremost, the thing that would popularize that being the Macintosh. And so we were working together. The schedules were uncertain. The quality was uncertain. The price. When Steve first came up, it was going to be a lot cheaper computer uh, than it ended up being. But that was fine. Uh, <laughs> so you worked in both places, in both well, we, we were in Seattle, and we right. fly down there. But Microsoft, if I remember correctly, uh, from what I read, 
uh, wasn't Microsoft one of the few companies that were allowed to even have a prototype of the yeah. Mac at the time? Well, what's interesting, what, what, what's hard to remember now is that Microsoft wasn't in the applications business then. The Mac, they took a big bet on the Mac because they, this is how they got into the apps business. I mean, Lotus dominated the apps business on the PC back then. Right. We had done just multi-plan, yeah. which was a hit on the Apple II. And then Mitch did an incredible job betting on the IBM PC. And 1, 2, 3 came in and, you know, ruled that, that part of the business. So the question was, what was the next paradigm shift right. that would allow for an entry? Word perfect. We had Word, but Word Perfect was by far the strongest in word processing, DBase, and database. And Word was a, that was a kind of a DOS a text. All of the, all of these products I'm saying were DOS-based right. products because Windows wasn't in the picture at the time. Right. That's more in the early 90s that that we get to that. And so we made this bet that the parent-time shift would be uh, graphics interface, and in particular that the Macintosh would make that happen with 128K of memory, 22K of which was for the screen buffer, uh, 14K was for the operating system. So it was... Uh, 14K. Yeah. 14K. Yeah. The original Mac operating system was 14K. 14K that uh, we had to have loaded when our software ran. So when the shell would come up, it had all the 128K. The OS was, the OS was bigger than 14K. It was in the 20s somewhere. <laughs> I see. So when we ship these, no, we ship these computers now with, you know, a gigabyte, two gigabytes of memory, and, and nobody remembers. 128K. I remember that. I remember, I remember paying a lot of money for computers with 128K in those days. So um, the two companies worked closely on the, on the Mac project because you were maybe not the only, but the principal or one of the principal software creators for it, right? Is that right? Well... Apple did the Mac itself, but we got, we got Bill and his team involved to write these applications. And we were doing a few apps ourselves. We did Mac Paint and Mac Draw and stuff like that. But uh, Bill and his team did some great work. Now, in terms of going, moving forward when, after you left and your company grew more and more strong, how did you, what did you think was going to happen to Apple after sort of the disasters that occurred after Steve left? Well, Apple's... Fate hung in the balance. Uh, we continued to do Macintosh software and, uh, you know, Excel, which Steve and I introduced together in New York City. Uh, uh, that was kind of a, a fun event. That went on and did very well. Um, but then, you know, Ma Apple just wasn't differentiating itself well enough from uh, the higher volume platform. And uh, Meaning Windows, right? I mean... DOS and Windows. Okay, but especially Windows in the 90s began to take off. By 1995, Windows became popular. The big debate wasn't sort of Mac versus Windows. The big debate was character mode interface versus graphics mode interface. And when the 386 came and we got more memory and the speed was adequate and some development tools came along, that paradigm bet on GUI paid off for everybody who'd gotten in early and said, you know, this is the way that's going to go. Uh, and but so Apple we, wasn't able to leverage its They weren't. You, they, they, after the 512K Mac was done, the product line just didn't evolve uh, as fast. Uh, well, Steve wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> uh, as it needed to. And we were actually negotiating a deal to invest and, and make some commitments and things with Gil Emilio. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. And Don't we were, be mean. Don't be mean to him. I'm sorry? <laughs> just saying the word Guil Emilio. You can see him just... Uh, and so I was calling him up on the weekend and all this stuff. And next thing I knew, Steve called me up and said, Don't worry about that negotiation with Gil Emilio. Uh, uh, you can just talk to me now. And I said, Wow. <laughs> Gil, Gil was a nice guy, but he had a saying. He said... Um, Apple is like a ship with a hole in the bottom, leaking water. And my job is to get the ship pointed in the right direction. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay.